Hello and welcome to the recording on ventilator protocol. So these are just basics of what a ventilator protocol could look like. So we'll talk about the ARDS network protocol just to begin with. Uh, there are many different kinds of protocols, spinal cord injury ventilator protocols, post-op cardiac protocols, you name it. There's a lot of different types of ventilator protocols. The big one that we'll talk about though is the ARDS net one. But the other thing is what is a protocol and why do we use them like what's their primary function what are some advantages and possible disadvantages of them so let's look in depth so what is a protocol so when we're looking at a protocol it usually gives us a set rules or guidelines for care and management of a particular procedure or a particular um, patients, right? It gives us that sort of guideline of that general game plan, if you will, to help us understand how to take better care of that patient and standardize it. So they're usually based upon current evidence-based practice. In other words, they go through a period of updating every couple of years. Traditionally, it depends on the facility, but they go through updating uh, to make sure if there's any newer evidence that have come out on that procedure or on the way of doing that, then that protocol is updated to make sure that we're taking the best care of our patients possible. The protocol should provide clear indications for inclusion. So there should be a clear set uh, parameters for us saying what type of patients are appropriate for this protocol, like in the ARDS network one. What type of patients are appropriate? What type of patients are are are, should be considered for this. So when we're looking at this, it helps us understand, okay, who is this for? So that way we're not employing it on the wrong type of patient population. If you try to use a neonate protocol and put it on an adult, it's not appropriate for that patient population. So when we're looking at this, is it appropriate? What's the patient population, right? Who should be included under this protocol management? The next one is possible contraindications or considerations. So these are patients like when we're looking at permissive hypercarbia, uh, patients that might have uh, issues with their intracranial pressures that might be people we don't want uh, to uh, put under, if they're an ICP patient, intracranial pressure patient, we may not want to do permissive hypercarbia on them. So these are contraindications or considerations uh, for different procedures. If a patient has really low or poor hemodynamics, should we do a lung recruitment maneuver protocol on that patient? Well, that's where you would put that into the considerations or contraindications in there. So that helps tell us, okay, is this patient, not only is it the right patient population, but within the right patient population, Population. What are some reasons why we shouldn't do this? Or if we do it, what are some things we have to be considerate of before we execute it? Uh, the goals of the policy. So what are the goals? Hey, what's the main outcome? What's the point of this policy and procedure? Is it to improve oxygenation if it's a recruitment maneuver? Is it to decrease atelectasis on a chest x-ray? Is it to decrease days on the ventilator, right? What's the goal of the policy? So these should be stated clearly on the policy and procedure. So then now everybody has a clear and defined goal of what defines success of this, this procedure, right? Or of this policy. Um, it should also point out the personnel that are used to execute the protocol. Who can perform this procedure, right? Who are the people making changes uh, on who make who follow who are following this protocol? So is it the physician only? Is it the respiratory therapy staff and the physician? Is it the physician extenders? Uh, is it going to be high-level nurses, right? Who all is included on this policy? So that should be uh, in there as well. Are you going to let the housekeeper, right? I love them, um, but are they the type of um, personnel that you want to be included to do something like changes on a ventilator, right? So it should clearly define which, which uh, professions are appropriate to execute that protocol. Uh, the next one is going to be details on the procedure itself. So it should provide almost a step-by-step -step or a very detailed guideline of how that procedure is executed. 
Uh, and that's going to be one of your big things to look at here. And then finally, references and protocol resources uh, and uh, resource personnel to help clarify if you have questions about the protocol. So the references help us when we have to update those pro protocols. And then finally, the resource personnel really help us if we need to talk to someone and be like, hey, this isn't covered in the protocol, you know, and it gives you a resource to go to when things are not as clear. So why use a protocol? What's the whole purpose of using a protocol? Well, one of the first points here is it provides a standardization of care, right? That's kind of a big thing. Uh, no matter what staff is on, the patient will get the same care and decisions uh, because that protocol is outlining how that procedure is done or how that care is performed. Uh, we know that no matter who's on, what their skill levels and so on and so forth is, uh, that that patient's getting high quality evidence-based care. So that's one big advantage is it standardizes and makes sure everybody has high quality evidence-based up-to-date care. So that's a big advantage there. You're not going to have one doctor saying, I want to do it this way, and another one saying, I want to do it that way, right? It provides standardization overall. Uh, so that's going to be very helpful. Now, can a doctor write an order to take people off of a protocol or to discontinue certain aspects of a protocol? Traditionally, yes. So that's something they can do. If a person has poor hemodynamics and they don't want to go up on the baseline pressure, the PEEP or the CPAP, if they don't want to go up on that, they can write discontinue that PEEP FIO2 scale. They can do such things traditionally. So that's something they can always modify and still keep that patient under that general protocol. Uh, it does provide a game plan for the outcome, especially when we have clear defined goals, right? When we have clear defined goals of the, the, uh, the procedure, right? Then we know, okay, our goal is to get a pH in this range. Our goal is to get a PAO2 in this range. Our goal is to have this outcome, right? So it gives everybody a game plan, right? And a goal for outcome. So that way we're all in clear understanding of what is successful and what isn't successful. And then the other thing, it provides a clinical step, right? It provides clinical steps. Uh, and that's one of the things that you're gonna see here is it helps us understand if the patient is still acidotic and these are the vent setting changes we've done, these are your options. So it provides a clinical step uh, of what to do next, right? right, step by step of what to do next. Where are we going with this? What's the next thing that's evidence-based to do? And that's one advantage there. It clarifies it. It provides it in black and white. There's a lot less dispute uh, traditionally of about what that next step is. So there's a good advantage there. Uh, the other thing here is this next big point is it uses common language. So it helps, especially if you have providers, travelers, uh, you have people from different areas of the nation or different areas in the world that come into practice. Uh, when we're seeing this, it, it makes for a common language for that policy and that procedure. So it better communicates the steps of care. When we all know we're talking about a, a cult peep, auto peep, intrinsic peep, so on and so forth, right? We have different terms for it. So it just provides that single use terms. It provides a single use uh, method of communication and it really could help streamline and expedite care overall. The other thing too is with that safety, right? It provides a safety for escalation of care because we are using common language. We all know what the next step is or we all can look up what the next step is when we have that protocol in front of us. So it's safety, right? It provides safety because we're using that common language. We're not gonna have miscommunication and say, oh, I thought you meant to go up on this versus that, right? So it helps make sure that that patient is as safe as possible by using common language or standardizing the language for that policy. The last part here is it may allow for you to have a better scope of practice. There was an AARC white paper that was done uh, years ago and it looked at uh, people that have protocols and it showed that the people that followed protocols were actually happier with their job uh, or their career, I should say, because they were able to perform these higher level procedures because they were following an evidence-based practice. It was standardized. It was known what the goals were. Everybody was clear who could do it, who couldn't do it, right? So it allowed for them to have a higher scope of practice ultimately when they're doing that. So that's something that you could uh, see as a benefit for doing these protocols. As long as they're done correctly, the big 
hazard would be potentially writing a protocol that ties your hands and says you have to do it this way, you have to do it that way, instead of giving you options for different types of patient alterations. Can someone be managed without the protocol? Well, let's talk about it. Most procedures can be done with a protocol. So that's one a good news thing. I can, even at something like arterial blood gas man, uh, arterial blood gas sampling, uh, EKG, uh, diagnostics tests, right? Those things, uh, therapeutic interventions like bronchoscopy, right? So on and so forth can be done with a protocol, nebulization protocol, right? You name it, they can be done with a protocol. So we have good news there that can help things especially clarify make sure we have good standard of care among all our providers but some patients may have special circumstances that the protocol doesn't account for hey what if they have this hiatal hernia and we're trying to do a lung recruitment maneuver but it didn't mention that in the considerations or contraindications well that's something that we need to talk about maybe that's not a procedure that we should be looking at for that type of patient right so the protocol can't when I make that statement, the protocol can't anticipate every single patient condition or circumstance. It cannot, right? Uh, that's too hard to anticipate every single thing that could possibly ever go on for not only indications and contraindications, but that's something that we need to take into consideration as a care team, right? Uh, if there is a special circumstance, could we modify the protocol? Are they still under protocol, even if it's not mentioned explicitly in that policy? Right, that's a discussion with the care team and the providers. Uh, the physician and or care team needs them then if they don't have a protocol, if they discontinue protocol or they order no protocol, then the physician or care team really needs to communicate clearly about the plan of care. What is successful? What are our saturation ranges? What's our pH ranges? What's our CO2 ranges? What's our x-ray right goals? What are, you know, what are our ways of adjusting if the patient has this response to it? What's the next step? I don't, I don't know because we don't have that written down. So we need to communicate about that ahead of time. Time. So that way we understand if something goes wrong, something goes goes off and they're not under protocol, what do we do next? Now traditionally, in that case, you would have to contact that physician. Uh, if they're not under protocol, you'd have to contact them there. If they're under certain protocols, we'll allow you to adjust without um, getting physician permission first, right? So just be aware of those protocols and how they're written as well. But that is a disadvantage to not having a protocol is now you're dependent upon the attending physician really being able to troubleshoot every single moment of that patient's care. And that can be very laborsome and it can take time. So you're not responding as quickly to that patient's needs. So that's another disadvantage, right? So most of the time the physician may need to write an order to discontinue a protocol if they have a special need as well. So that's where we have to have a clear plan. Once they discontinue it, it's not not necessarily a bad thing uh, but we just need to make sure we have a plan okay what happens if their pH goes below this or what happens when their saturation and po 2s go below that right so we need to have that clear plan when they discontinue a protocol what happens when their uh, when their ICPs their intracranial pressures change right we need to have that plan pl in place if they don't have a protocol so the big thing here is protocols too can tie the hands or the escalation of care of patients. If it says you have to do this before doing this, before doing that, before doing that, to get to where you want to go with this patient, then it ties your hands, it forces you down that flow chart. So sometimes protocols can be written in a way where it gives you options. Hey, the patient has a pH that's less than 725. One of these following options are considered evidence-based. All of the following are evidence-based. Pick one that's most appropriate for your patient. Right? That's another way to write that where now we can focus on what is going to work best for this patient that's in front of us. Right? Still evidence-based, but that way we're not tying the hands of the providers. That way they don't have to write to discontinue a protocol just so that they can do what's appropriate for that patient. All right, so we talked a little bit about what is a protocol, advantages and disadvantages. Now let's talk about one of the big ones, the ARDS Net, National Institute of Health, National Heart Lung Blood Institute, ARDS Ventilation Protocol. I know it's a lot of words, but you know, it's kind of fun to do it that way too. 
this is one of the most notorious ventilator protocols that are out there. That's why I'm mentioning it here. It was also known as the ARMA trial back in the day. Uh, so that's one of those things that you might hear or see in literature uh, or hear at a conference where they say, hey, the, according to the ARMA trial, right, that's what they're talking about is the ARDS net study that came out. So this one, the big history of this one, it was conducted to compare lung protective strategy using lower tidal volumes of 6 mL per kilo of predicted body weight with the what at the time was conventional of 12 mLs per kilo of predicted body weight. So they used to ventilate people at 12 mLs per kilo of predicted body weight versus 6. So they said, let's cut that in half. Let's try it at 6 mLs per kilo and go from there. So they designed it for a specific population. They designed it for patients that were in acute respiratory distress syndrome. So that was the goal of it is to look at that specific patient population right that specific patient population the study had to end early this is an important point that if you haven't heard this before listen up they had to end this study early because it was no longer ethical to continue to ventilate at 12 mls per kilo that's a big deal because at 12 mls per kilo it was causing so much trauma so much pressure so much damage that they were continuing to see detrimental results compared with their 6 ml group so they actually had to end that study early because of it so the national heart lung blood institute and ards network is a network to test and manage strategies to improve patients with ARDS. And ARDS, big thing in adult critical care medicine. So that's why I'm making a big point about the ARDS net protocol. So you can see the history of it. It really did help change things and they continually update this to make sure it's up to date with the evidence-based medicine. So the ARDS network, uh, the idea here was to avoid alveolar hyperinflation and implement lung recruitment maneuvers uh, by either elevating PEEP levels or to do a traditional lung recruitment maneuver. Because we're using such lower tidal volumes, smaller tidal volumes, then we needed to do something to help with alveolar distension, but not over distension. So that's where the high PEEPs came into play. And that's where you see this whole thing over here. This is the the high arm and the low arm of the PEEP FIO2 scale. So you might see this at ARDS Network Hospitals where, hey, uh, we're on a PEEP of eight. So let me just do an example here. We are on a PEEP of eight and 50% oxygen, and then their saturation is lower than where we want it to be, right? They're below the goal saturation level. So what's our next step according to this policy? Well, it says, okay, our next step is to actually increase the PEEP to 10. Right, so it gives you that step up and also step down of what to do, right? So that person you would turn up, up to a peep of 10, so they'd be on 50% oxygen in a peep of 10, and then you would see what happens from there. Well, what if that doesn't work? Well, what's the next step? Then we would go to a FIO2 of 60% and a peep of 10, we'd keep that peep there. So you can see how it helps you walk your way up, but it also helps you titrate your way down as well. So the whole idea here is to gently increase these until we get the proper oxygenation level or titrate them down until we get the proper oxygenation level. So the whole point here, the big goal of the ARDS net is to mitigate ventilator induced lung injury. So we can tolerate atelectasis uh, that can be managed uh, by uh, two different PEEP FIO2 scales. Here's the low arm at the top here where I was doing the example earlier. Then here's the high arm at the bottom here. And the evidence shows uh, as of recording this, no difference in the outcomes or anything like that between these two trials, between these two arms, if you will, of the PEEP FIO2 scale, the higher arm or the lower arm. The big thing that I would put my little two cents in here, uh, so don't quote me on it, would be looking at hemodynamics and mean airway pressure. Sometimes if that person has very poor hemodynamics, then the lower arm could be an advantage there because there could be less compression on the vena cava, right? But traditionally with ARDS patients, they're going to have lower um, lower chances of hemodynamic issues because the lungs are so restrictive and elastic uh, uh, that you're not going to have a lot of expanding that squishes the vena cava because the lung tissue is so 
firm and hard, right? It's it's going to make it hard to expand. So because the, their compliance is so low, we may not have an issue with higher peep levels. So that's something to think about there uh, as well. So we do understand that with low tidal volumes, we're going to have more atelectasis, right? Makes sense. We're using smaller volumes, so less of the lung is going to be opened up when we deliver a breath. However, we can mitigate that with higher mean airway pressure or peep levels uh, most of the time. Uh, the ARDS net included uh, a PF ratio. PF ratio is very important when you're talking about critical care medicine. Uh, less than or equal to 300 uh, were considered if they had bilateral diffuse homogeneous uh, infiltrates on their x-ray that are consistent with pulmonary edema. Uh, there should be no cl clinical evidence of left atrial hypertension. In other words, you're trying to rule out left-sided heart failure, right? You're trying to rule out that type of thing, which can be done on echo uh, or even sometimes ultrasound. It just depends what's going on. But those were the in people that were included. And the initial settings, this is the calculations that they used. And it comes out in kilos, right? So it helps us, and that's the predicted body weight calculation. Uh, and that's the calculation I used as a provider for uh, 10 years. So that's one of those things that you'll see there too, is that's how we use their predicted, uh, calculate their predicted body weight and did their tidal volumes based upon that. Once we calculated their predicted body weight, then we would select a ventilator mode. So traditionally for your uh, pediatric through adults, we'd set the ventilator to get around eight mLs per kilo uh, tidal volume of their predicted body weight, unless they had a known ARDS. So we're gonna start people in eight mLs per kilo around that area. And then we can reduce the tidal volume by one mL per kilo obviously all of this is predicted body weight, at intervals around two hours until the tidal volume is at six mLs per kilo, right? So we're gently lowering it down over time. Uh, the initial rate that we're setting the ventilator is going to be uh, around their baseline minute ventilation. Uh, so that's gonna be the BSA calculation that we did earlier on uh, and that you've seen in your chapter as well. But we should not set it over the rate of 35, right? We're getting really fast uh, if we could do that. We're gonna adjust the tidal volume and the rate to achieve a, a, P, a adequate pH and an adequate plateau pressure. In other words, we try to keep that plateau pressure under 30 centimeters of water pressure. That's the big goal because that plateau pressure represents alveolar pressure. And we're trying to avoid ventilator over distension and ventilator trauma. And so if we keep the plateau pressures under 30 centimeters of water pressure, that really helps keep those uh, alveoli from being damaged. And so we try to keep that plateau pressure under 30 centimeters of water. So the goals, hey, what are the goals, right? The pH goals and the plateau pressure goals? Well, the pH goals were seven, anywhere between 730 and 745. Um, so that's what we're looking at there. If the pH was 715 to 730, so low, then it told you what steps to take. Do you see this? This is the application of talking about protocols. It says, hey, this is their goals, and if they don't meet this, this is the next step that's appropriate to do. So this would tell you, hey, if their pH is in that range, you can increase respiratory rate uh, until you hit that range, or their PACO2, right? So you can do that, but the maximum rate you can go up to is 35, right? Uh, if the pH is still less than 7.15 and you increase the rate to 35, the, then you might have to go up on tidal volume, right? You might have to go up on tidal volume. And in this case, you might have to exceed your plateau pressure of 30 because that pH of 7.15 may not be survivable, right? That's the 7.20 to 7.25 range is what's considered survivable. Uh, so that's where you're looking at that there. Or they might consider at this point giving sodium bicarb. Be careful with sodium bicarb because of the transient increase in CO2. That's the carbonic acid equation. So take a second to pause, go Google image, carbonic acid equation, and then look at what happens if I increase bicarb and you bring it across, what happens to CO2 production? Well, if I increase uh, a bicarb on one side, I'm gonna increase CO2 production on the other side. So that's also potential danger there, is you're actually increasing the chance of a metabolic acidosis there, 
right? So the big thing here is to, is to look at these goals and sort of see this is the application. This gives you clear steps of what to do when different things happen. So everybody's on the same page. We're taking all taking excellent care of this patient because we know their goals. We know their management. The goal plateau pressure is try to keep it under 30 centimeters of water, right? Try to keep it under 30 centimeters of water. So we're going to check the plateau. Usually it's about a half second pause, um, at least every four hours when we're going in to see those patients. Uh, if we it is over 30, uh, then we, or if we change uh, a PEEP setting or a tidal volume setting, if we go up on either of those, if we go up on PEEP, go up on tidal volume, check a plateau because you might have just caused a change that made the plateau go over 30. And you don't want to be causing harm. The patient's already sick enough. They don't need you making them even worse, right? So check a plateau pressure after you make those changes that could cause that to go up. So that would be things like your, your um, PEEP or your tidal volume. If it is over 30, then the idea here is now to decrease tidal volume in one ml per kilo steps to about four. Once you get to four mls per kilo, that's sort of the minimum. That's very, very small tidal volumes. Uh, not evidence really below that, um, unless we talk about high frequency ventilation, even then that's more for the neonate population. But if the plateau pressure is under 25 and the tidal volume is under six, then we can increase by one ml per kilo, we can start to go up on their tidal volumes if their plateau pressures start to come down. Let's say the patient's steroids kick in, they're, they're coming past this ARDS net with their infections clearing up, whatever is going on that caused their ARDS, then we could automatically start to go up, back up on our tidal volumes to be more appropriate for that patient's physiological needs. So that's a good news. So it tells us not only to, to how to titrate down, but also how to titrate up. So this is good news. If a plateau, uh, if they're if they're breath sync stacking or desynchronous, uh, if they're having high work of breathing and they need a bigger tidal volume, then you could increase it, right? As long as the plateau remains under 30, right? So that's if they're air hungry, if they're working hard, then that gives us an option uh, to help that patient out as long as we keep the plateau under 30, right? And then finally, oxygenation on this on this goal so this is just your general management stuff and we'll talk about the wean thing but oxygenation for the ARDS net was to get a PO2 between 55 and 80 so and even a set 88 to 95 right so the whole goal here is to keep that PO2 above 55 as much as possible uh, we are going to use a minimum PEEP uh, for this when we're using the traditional PEEP FIO2 scale of five, All right? That's the minimum level there. And these are the two arms that I've already previewed for you as well. The big thing is just to make sure that you're titrating when it's appropriate. So that way you're not using too much PEEP. You're not using too much oxygen because too much PEEP and too much oxygen, especially if their lungs are getting better, can cause harm by over distending and impeding mucociliary escalator and mucociliary activity, as well as impeding the ability to produce surfactant, right? So there are harms and damages, especially oxidative lung injury, uh, especially neonates. Those preterm neonates uh, have a higher chance of oxidative lung injury as well. So you got to look at all these factors. So not only titrating up when we need to, but also keep an eye out for when to start titrating down as well. So that way we're not harming the patient either. All right, weaning. How do you know when to wean on this protocol? It's a vent protocol. we got to cover not only settings, but when do you get them off right and that's the other part there uh, so conducting spontaneous wean trials is the big thing that they wanted you to do so if they're on 40 percent or less and a peep of eight or less or 50 percent and five or less right um, and make sure that they're they're not getting worse make sure that their blood pressure is stable make sure they can breathe spontaneously make sure they're not on a paralytic because they're not going to breathe on their own very well if they can't breathe at all because they're paralyzed right so those it's just telling you okay what's included make sure that these are your considerations does that sound familiar from the earlier part of this considerations are a big thing here so what are our considerations before we put someone on this protocol that's what we're looking at spontaneous breathing trial itself okay how do i perform this procedure right okay if you've checked for all the things above right uh and they've been pretty uh pretty good right they've been you can tolerate a wean up to 120 minutes 
uh, for these patients. Now, they give you options, right? They don't tie your hands here. Notice that's the point here, right? They didn't tie your hands and say, you have to do it this way only. No, they give you options. You can place them on a T-piece. You can do a trach collar if they're a trach, or you could do a CPAP and pressure support. So you could do pressure support ventilation with them. See how they didn't tie your hands with it? Right? So that's one of the key things there with an advantage of this type of policy is it doesn't tie your hands and say, you only have to do a T-piece. You only have to do a pressure support. No, you have other options that are still evidence-based and you gotta pick the one that's best for your patient. I used to love T-piece weaning my uh, heart patients where they were on the vent because they had heart failure and that PEEP and the mean airway pressure really helps restrict the blood flow in there so it helps reduce cardiac workload. Well, when you put someone into a T-piece where they're just heated aerosol going past, then that takes away all that positive pressure that's helping restrict the cardiovascular structures. And therefore it looks at what the heart can do really without any pressure in there. So if, if I were to extubate this patient, how healthy is their heart gonna be? So like even T-piece weaning had its place in my practice, right? Sounds really old school and it was, but for that patient population, Physiologically, I thought it was more appropriate. And so therefore, in this situation, that's an option they give you. Now, is it gonna be the number one option everybody picks? Depends on the culture of that facility and the practice. Traditionally, most people will do that pressure support, the CPAP of five, pressure support of five, but um, they they don't tie your hands. So be thankful, right? That's a good, that's a sign of a good policy is it doesn't tie the hands. It allows the clinicians to adjust per that patient scenario, right? You can't anticipate every scenario. Uh, you got to look for tolerance, right? So they're saying, hey, these are signs that the patient is doing okay. That's another sign of a good policy. Is it clear? Is it defined? Do we have known outcomes of it, right? Uh, is their, pH, uh, their respiratory rate less than 35 when they're weaning? Is their pH greater than 7.3 when they're on the wean, right? So that way we understand uh, what's going on here. Did their heart rate change? Did their saturation change, right? Do they get worse or do they stay about the same? Do they stay stable, right? If they're uh, doing good and looking good, then consider uh, weaning and extubate if everything else is reversed or at the primary causes. And we have a whole extubation lecture, obviously. But that's where I want you to sort of see the reason why I brought up the ARDS net protocol. A, it's one of the most prolific, uh, prolific one out there. And then B, I wanted to highlight some of the advantages. It has your goals. Who's included, right? The patient population. It has your goals. It has uh, uh, places where it gives you options, right? It doesn't tie your hands. And it gives you those clear considerations for patients that are appropriate and for different situations as well. So hopefully you see an advantage to protocols, especially protocols that are well written, uh, really can help you, especially one of those things where it can help you expand your scope and be more happy with your job because now you're not having to call a high level provider for every single thing, right? So now you as a care team can take faster care of those patients without having to worry about, is this the exact step? Is this the exact step? And if you're ever in doubt what step to take, then that's what the care team is for. That's what the protocol is for. That's what the physician is for, right? To help with that and to help guide that. But this will give you that opportunity to make sure everybody has the same language. Everybody's on the same page. We all have the same goals, right? We all understand the what the procedure entails, what the different considerations for the procedure are. So it helps with safety. It helps with efficient care, right? And it helps make sure that you can respond in a timely manner to a patient situation compared to having to wait till a physician figures out what's going on on who this patient is and then tries to make a decision off of that, right? It could be a lot faster, a lot more efficient that way.